um, did his uh, PhD in 2011 at the MTA garden and then uh, moved to uh, Ohio, Columbus, Columbus, Ohio for a other fellowship and uh, after that, since then, he's in, uh, in UK and Oxford. And uh, so today he will talk about new data and new methods and uh, thermodynamic and Milky Way models. <laughs> Uh, give them a hand to the I hope everybody's a happy place. People cheer before you start. Um, what I'm going to talk about is mostly about the problems that we'll, we will encounter with the new surveys. Naturally, currently, we are in a time of preparing for all the data that come from Gaia, which is highly non trivial. And just got the models essentially done in the past month that should fit that state. Um, I would like to acknowledge, of course, my PhD father, Martin Asplund, and Maria, especially, who's my host here, and also <coughs> is a very valuable collaborator on all spectroscopy questions. Just to give you an impression of how the field developed, this is from a 2003 paper, Ben and all essentially listing up the big surveys that existed at that time. So this is the one display, we will discuss this later. So magnesium versus iron, that's an alpha element versus iron abundance, which tells you about the history of the system and the structure of the galactic disk. And all this, this is that the big sample in 2014, but this is when we go away from the solar neighborhood just have a handful of stars in such typical old surveys. So what you could do there was you went there, you looked at some patterns that you see in abundant space, and so they will use this if you look at the high alpha population here, which fades out, to claim that there is a short scale length of the so-called thick disk, or I would here say chemical thick disk. However, um, the interesting thing is the modern picture already looks like that. So this is just three years of development and we encounter entire new challenges because instead of a couple of stars that we see somewhere in the galaxy and single star samples, uh, usually 20 stars were an important sample to publish on, we now have hundreds of thousands of stars from which we derive density distributions everywhere in the galaxy. This means that we have to change our lifestyle in fitting those data. Because before that, I mean, everything was for some noise and a little bit of structure. I mean, it's just hot noise. Do I find a star somewhere there? Do I not? But now the task will be to really make quantitative use of all those distributions and to be certain that we don't fit bogus data, just to give the general picture. So, 10 years ago, all this wasn't there. The biggest sample that existed was the Hipparchus sample, essentially useful after 1997, uh, with about 100,000 stars, among which we had 500 stars with spectroscopy. Now we have several spectroscopic surveys, we have several photometric surveys, we have the astro-seismic surveys, and we get new astronometry from Gaia, and if you look at the comparison, this is just an image from, of the Milky Way, so the Tumas uh, Milky Way picture is stolen, and then overplotted the densities for expected densities for Gaia stars, and the region that we knew before is a approximately as large as the tip of my finger on this plane. This was Hipparchus. And Gaia delivers us the entire galaxy or galactic disk um, up to the galactic center. And this means that now we suddenly have about a, mil a billion stars with parallaxes, um, tens of millions of stars with high resolution or medium resolution spectroscopy, and a 10 kiloparsec spatial extent. Why I'm putting this out so much is actually we just wrote a proposal for Dirac 4, which is the next generation supercomputer. And actually, even with our current computing power, this means 
that this thing, just fitting those data at a fair one-to-one -one basis, will take all the resources of the largest supercomputer of the UK. Um, this is number one. So our first problem is make optimal use of combined data sources. And we can combine, uh, compare our situation as astrophysicists currently to a German fairy tale, Sterntaler. Um, I think um, in, in English it's uh, star money, uh, which is a poor child that went out into the woods and let the stars rain down as gold coins. And we are in this happy time where all the stars rain down on us and we get all this wonderful data. However, there is a problem. They are different currencies, so they are not homogenized. You have seen there are all those different spectroscopic surveys. And if we don't take care, we have DMARC and France and whatever, but we can't pay with it. So merging those surveys and to make one common sense out of it is a task that hasn't been fully undertaken. Then the next thing is of course selection functions. We need to be sure we understand which stars were selected. And the big question is the errors in systematics. And if we think about fairy tale land and if our little girl gets too greedy, and the stars are raining down, it can also look like that afterwards. Because if we do not understand this, if we do not understand our selections, our unknown errors, we are suddenly in quantitative space. Any mistake there will make us infer wrong statements about galactic structure, about galactic history. This goes as much as that we need to know the exact size of our errors. I'll give you an example. Some people will not like that. Um, it's actually a quite sad story, but very interesting for what we are facing. This is based on the first large spectroscopic sample for the Milky Way. It was SAGWER, took 500,000 stars. The stars that were used for this sample were just near 30,000 stars, so several magnitudes less than what we are facing. And based on those 30,000 stars, authors 2007 in Nature claimed that there was a so-called dual halo of the Milky Way. Now, I'm a theorist, and I would cheer at that idea because there are theoretical predictions that there should be some duality in the galactic halo, because it goes back to 1986 where people pointed out changes in dynamic friction, so depending on how the satellites come in, fall into the Milky Way halo, uh, the direction on which they come in, their mass are linked to metallicity and this is then linked to where the stars are shed in the Milky Way halo and on which orbits. However, so they were claiming that there was a dual halo with an inner halo which was more metal rich and prograde rotating and an outer halo with a more metal poor component in retrograde motion and of course, to puff it up, uh, consistent with that, they found an extreme vertical velocity dispersion. Now, this is a wonderful thing. Here's a sketch of what the press thought of this. Um, however, it went down to quite an argument, and we argued in the first paper that there is no dual halo. They answered, and this is the remaining two arguments, and I'm. I mean, I think the question is settled, but it's very interesting to look at why it fits. So the first argument is two Gaussians are needed for the much poor stars in the Milky Way. So they claim that there's two components. They say those are more metal poor that are on the retrograde end. And they also claim that they see an intense trend of metallicities with altitude in this end. Let's look at the two Gaussian claim. So here you have the distribution function, and you see this velocity distribution here. Um, this is the azimuth of velocity in kilometers per second, and when they fit this with Gaussian components, they need two. So they claim that's why we need to have two components in the Milky Way. You get varied it if you look at their parameters, because they offer different samples, and we are just plotting their estimates for the mean azimuth velocity of their components on their own data versus um, their selection. So, depending on which stars they select, the mean velocity of their components varies wildly. 
This is a thing that points to some bias brain in your sample. Depending on how you look, the quality shift drastically. And also, on the other side here, you see um, what a more sophisticated analysis yields. So we looked in 2000, last year at if we can understand those velocity distribution functions, and the green arrow bars are the same velocity distribution that we see over here, just with Poisson errors on them, and the black curve is the model that we put in, and the colored curves, just different assumptions about the velocity errors that you make. So this sample doesn't have proper distances. You have to derive the distances from putting stars onto sequences, and then estimating the distance and then they get a point estimate for, for the velocity. If I now make an estimate on how long the point velocity estimates are, including sorting stars onto wrong branches, which are those two curves here, then you see that you can explain the observed data fully just by accounting for the most likely error that is on the sample. And the second thing, the trend of metallicities with altitude. This is a marvelous example for why we need to handle our biases. So what they are saying is you start off at zero kiloparsec on the top left corner and then you go down until you reach nine kiloparsec altitude and you see how the metallicity shifts from pure disk metallicities down to higher metallicities but then it doesn't stop but it shifts further to even lower metallicities. That looks very convincing. It doesn't look that harmless when we plot it in a plane. So this is just doing the same thing as was done here, but sorting stars here by distance from the sun. So what I use is, this is the vertical altitude set, and I use the in-plane distance, just the remaining vector, so that this is a true distance, and this are, these are circles of identical distance around my point of origin. And this up here are just log cheese for control, so you see the ordering effect, how you go from dwarfs to subgiants, um, and the giant stars in your sample, or subgiant stars mostly. And here you see a very interesting feature. There is a metal poor ring in constant distance around me. Also, all other features, it all aligns with the distance from the sun, not with vertical altitude. That is a typical selection bias. You can actually model this, and this is the real striking thing, and yeah? the frightening thing. I mean, they did really good work, but the green arrow bars are the measurements. So I just replicate every step they do, and I plot the mean metallicity in the Halo sample versus the distance from the sun. And there you also see the dip that we have seen here at intermediate distances. And now I just do a very simple thing. I take my galaxy model, usually I'm a pure theorist, I have a population synthesis on that. I just create some mock halo, which is metal poor. Um, I cut it at metallicities larger than minus 1.5. And then just measuring this mock sample, what I would get. And if I had perfect distances, you would observe the blue line. And this is just the mere selection effect on the sample. You see the dip again. This dip is actually sitting um, at the border from the bright plates to the faint plates in Segway. Segway has two magnitude selections because you, they have a wide, about four magnitude wide magnitude selection. They make bright plates, which go from 15 to 17.5 magnitude, and then a faint plate going down to 19.5 or 20. And so this is the transition, and what you can see here is subgiant stars are far more luminous when they are metal poor. So when your sample slides over the boundary to the subgiants, over the turnoff, only the most metal poor stars remain last in the sample, dominate you there, and you see the slump to low metallicities. Now you can do the next thing, you just replicate the distances, just do exactly the same distance measurement, which 
is the pick points. And this just doesn't look like my data. But if I then try to make a best estimate on how the errors in the sample are, and Sango has a log G systematic uh, lowers the log G of metal dwarfs significantly. And it has an increased error towards lower metallicities too, which is understandable if you have less spectral lines, thinner spectral lines, it gets more difficult to recognize them. And when you put this in, you just end up with a red line which perfectly fits your observation. So two messages from this. This is the first large sample that we have. And we have no way without a perfect modeling approach to understand what we are doing. If we don't get this right, we will just find dual halos, quadruple disks, or whatever you like. So the conclusion, we need a quantitative and qualitative of understanding the data. So the first thing we did to tackle that was creating something termed Bayesian spectroscopy as a fashion word, I would prefer calling it probabilistic spectroscopy or spectroscopy with four PDFs. So we have to get away from this perspective of just, you have a star, you determine a best fit parameter set, then on this best fit parameter set someone else tells you what your distance calibration is, and then with that distance calibration you fit your kinematics and then put this into a dynamic model. But this doesn't work. You need the full probability distribution function. So we need to get away from this picture to actually <coughs> describing a star by its full probability distribution function to fit it in the models later. Just again to summarize what we have, we have large samples, <coughs> varying data sources, etc. So we have to create this one pipeline to fit it all. This is a relatively old slide, but I make I think I can't leave it away. Um, what is a Bayesian scheme? So Bayesian schemes are just what you use for inference about the world. So you have an observation which I call O. This is your observation. And then on the right hand you have your observational constraints. So you ask the question, what is the likelihood of making that observation given my parameters? Then you know the likelihood of your parameters, which you call your prior, and you um, have to divide it by the likelihood of making the observations, and then you get what you really want, which is the likelihood distribution of your parameters given the observations. So, um, to rule out a misunderstanding, many people use the word observables. I find this a bit dangerous, so for example, calling effective temperature and observable on stars. Um, but that isn't. You never make an observation on temperature, you have an observation of a spectrum that delivers your likelihood distribution, a probability distribution on your parameter which you call temperature. Then you can describe this by giving the maximum value and an error, but very frequently it's not just a simple Gaussian function which you subsume by that. You have to assume that your observations are conditionally independent and then you can just multiply all your constraints. This makes things relatively easy conceptually. Now whenever you want a likelihood in one parameter, you just project this out of your very nice multi-dimensional PDF. Now you will say, of course, this is insane, and it was a bit at the start because this is, I don't know, 10, 20, don't count the dimensions of your parameter space. So you can't represent this anymore, but you can do it because parameter space for stars can be simplified. So they are the things that are constraining your photometry and your models, and they are the things that constrain your spectrum. So the central parameter space is just the effective temperature, the surface gravity, and the metallicity. There are some things about photometry, there, but the rest is mostly independent of the other stuff, like abundances and then your H estimates. H's are of course folded with metallicity, but they, the H estimate will generally not so much depend on the specific silicon abundance, uh, abundance of my star. Um, similarly, the mass that you estimate for the star, etc. 
So you can divide your parameter space in a handy three or four dimensional space plus additional dimensions that hang on it. So then the big problem is getting the spectral information. This is what costs us most of the time. And here is one of the central problems. When you have a stellar spectrum, so these are our high resolution pipeline fitting spectra, you see those nice lines. You have the low resolution stuff fitting a LAMOS spectrum, which I did just uh, two weeks ago. And when you have that, how do you cook up parameters out of it? And actually, we don't have a definite answer for this. I'm not entirely happy about our PDFs because there are no real information in the literature, no line of literature that tells you how to get a PDF in the parameter space from your stuff. There are millions of papers that tell you how to get the best fit for this stuff. But that's not what we want. <coughs> Just to show you how important that is, so you get the spectrum then and you pull out your parameters into your multidimensional probability space and let's look at what happens to you. Simple temperature estimate for a star. This is a Segre star. We have nice SDSS photometry, which is actually pretty good for getting effective temperatures. We have, and this constraint is with the green line, we have the spectroscopic estimate with the red line. And for comparison, I show you what the SSPP pipeline says, don't believe the error and what I ended created in 2008 sat with an intermediate resolution spectrum. And we lie somewhere in between, but look at what happens to the combined estimate. So classically, you would just take those two estimates and say, okay, this lies here, this lies here, so we must be somewhere in the middle and we are doing pretty well. If you combine the information in a fair way, the maximum of the combined estimate from all your data sources right of the distribution. What? Yes, probability. I'm always cautious to write, not to write P. Um, so, this is what the star looks like in the Mokchi temperature plane. This is the exactly same star. And I brought you the photometric estimate once, or the spectroscopic estimate here and the combined estimate down here. What you also see is photometry includes the stellar models. So you see the main sequence going through here, then there's the sub-giant branch, and you have some um, giant branch up here. That must be some horizontal branch stuff. And in the spectroscopic estimate, this information is not present. This is just the pure spectroscopy asked for. And you have to combine those likelihoods. And they combine non trivially here because there are other dimensions behind, namely mostly metallicity. So, as you can see down here, this is the mean metallicity for the star. And the color plane here, this is the spectroscopic metallicity estimate. And you see that they deviate between here and there. And you can also see that in this space that should be nicely shared between spectroscopy and the photometry, those little dots give you the expected metallicity from the photometry and they just don't match up here. They only match down here where you get the final PDF. Just to show you quickly how nice it is when you have suddenly parallax information, this is a star with, uh, with a proper parallax from the parkours, this was a high resolution spectrum, and then you see that you can constrain the log chi, and you will not ask even for what the parameters look like up here. This would be allowed by the spectroscopy for the star to have a lower log chi, so to put it to be a giant, but this, uh, you have the constraints that forbid that, and you get a better estimate. So why do we need to do this, really? Um, it's a lot of computation power. You could just say you do it just like everyone did before. Get some spectroscopic estimate, do a little Bayesian pipeline which does a little bit of photometry and then does some edge calculations and you are fine. The problem is we have those complicated constraints.
constraints. So this is just again a star from Sacred, who you have the photometric or polar constraint here, then the spectroscopic constraint. And now for comparison, I degenerate this spectroscopic constraint as it would be done usually. And the result, the combined probability distribution function looks completely different. And if you do this in a quantitative way, and you just plot the differences in temperature versus a divided by the arrows. So those epsilons are just difference between the two estimates divided by the estimated error. You see, this is the same stars. They should lie well within a one sigma ellipse. And they scatter our battle just because we're not representing the PDF properly when you do the simplified approach. And the same thing is not even your error estimates are believable. They have a systematic change in, this is the estimated log G error, um, surface gravity error, and again, the full pipeline has a systematically different error given, plus they weigh widely in the values of the single stops. So we need to approach this in a complete approach. Just to show you what happens to an H R diagram when we do this combined method. So on the left hand side I have the second example. It's low resolution, there are no parallaxes, it's a dire situation. And of course for comparison we see the values from the SSP pipeline um, versus what we derive on the other side. I color code it with metallicity and overplot isochrones of the identical metallicity, uh, old isochrones. So these are the 10 and 12 giga year isochrones. So nothing that is colored red must be right of this isochrome, and nothing that is colored green must be in this forbidden space here. Now you see that classical pipelines just put stars in between here without even considering that this is forbidden terrain. You will later have those stars in your samples and make severe errors when you use them. And of course you see that this looks better up here, it's far better ordered, and the same for the high resolution sample. This is the um, a slightly older version for the Gaia ESO input catalog or um, high quality Gaia ESO calibration sample. So this is the best you can do, and our estimates in comparison and you see again that those stars here, despite all those calibration efforts, were off the allowed region where they could be, whereas uh, our method places them rightly on the correct values. Hans Wolter. Okay, this one um, asks another point. I mean, there are two aspects to it, right? The first one, you rightfully say that clearly spectroscopic pipelines know nothing about stellar evolution, therefore, place. Yes. Stars with no isochrones can be no isochrones. So, if you then say that's extremely impossible, that some of the by construction they have to fall into the realm of isochrones, even of the right intensity. Um, so, I fully agree so with you, but there is a tweak that I was silent about, which is if you go the classical way, you have a star ending up here. And your spectroscopist delivered this analysis to you. Where is the star really? So I agree that people have this very stupid ways of shifting to isochrones, but it's a smart way of shifting to isochrones. We're not in the question still is what are actually ways of this in principle to check that the then resulting error bars really have, um, if you had divine uh, knowledge or infinite information would actually be I have actually spared you the numbers. I'm very sorry. You can read it up in the paper. We have two different subsamples for the calibration sample. And this is, I admit, this is just the first test. But comparing the errors that we get compared to them, they have two different quality categories. They have ones this, and they have ones stars plus astro seismology uh, on uh, diameters, etc. So, you know, interferometric measurements. 
So they have two entirely different quality categories. We are not changing our analysis. We didn't use the interferometry. But the error goes uh, halves to what the two samples. So we see how their quality goes better. And actually, in more than half, so we knew, know that we are doing far better in the derived errors than we should do. So there, there is a measurement on that. This is really the superior method. The other thing is, of course, we should measure that again and again and try to optimize this because there are some troubles that might be helping in the issues. The other thing is, I mean, you, you cannot just wave the argument in a way that you need the full PDF to correct your stars later on. I mean, these stars that are off here are just an extreme sample and an extreme example. But if I don't conserve the full probability distribution function, I will also misplace the other stars. I, I'm not arguing with you. No, no. I'm just... <laughs> I know. Good. The other thing is, this is a bit surprising, this is the second sample again. And this also tells you another reason why you would need this. So, the points are here, just the expectation values and the errors of the stars in the temperature log G plan. And the colors on those points tell you what the relative distance error, sigma x, so this is the dispersion in the estimated distance divided by the distance uh, to the star is that you estimate. And what you see here is looking at the colors of this plot, there are a couple of preferred regions, but you can't tell by just giving out some best parameters for a star if the star is easy to use or make a good prediction for what the error is. So we have this one outlier here where we don't really know where it is in distance. There is a really bad star near the turn off here than quite next to a star that is far better. So you have no safe prediction without using a full method to tell what the distance errors are. And to get back to our velocity distributions, this is what we ultimately need to assess the kinematics of our galaxy or how the component or whatever you want to measure. Just the most recent example, because I showed you that Lamos spectrum, uh, just to show you how nicely that lines up. This was just a one-week trial. I had a guest from China, Wei Chang, who brought some spectra from Lamos. He had control values from a um, high-resolution test sample. And this is the comparison between the results of our Bayesian pipeline to the high-resolution sample. And this is just pure photometry that has to go wrong, then this is when you just use spectroscopy alone, and this is what happens when you do the full method combining photometry, spectroscopy, and the stellar models. There are a couple of outliers, um, which are caused because we didn't clean up the sample, um, we didn't clean out some stars that show significant fringing in the infrared, so the spectroscopy fits, I suppose, when drawn up there or the high resolution sample might be wrong. Lastly, if you have Gaia, this is just to a random secular star. The distance or the distance modulus accuracy that you get so down here is better versus the parallax error that you would have with Gaia. And at some point Gaia parallaxes are just not good, but your distance estimates stay great or reasonable. And this is just because if we look at the raw distance distribution for such a star, this estimate here, once we know from Gaia that by the parallax that the star can't be closer than a certain value, you can cut away all this and you can fit the star onto some stellar branch even if un with uncertainty. Good. Just interim conclusion. Just in principle, this is the way we have to go. Either this or some other probabilistic methods or methods that make full use of the available information. I think the Canon approach of Melissa Ness is very interesting that recently came up. Um, but we have to do things that give a better view on a neutral basis where the uh, probability lies. What also should be mentioned is this virus back on the modes. Because you have all your parameter estimates, Every single model point 
is under fire. So you can see that suddenly there are residuals in colors for the stars. You can use clusters in a more sophisticated way to constrain your stellar models, etc. Um, the big hurting point here is there is no literature on getting PDFs from spectroscopy or hardly any literature. We have no experience and I'm a little bit in, in the void about how good our methods are to currently get those PDFs from spectroscopy. Um, okay, now the question is, are models ready for those data? And I mean, we want to learn from data ultimately. We want to understand what a galaxy is and what those galaxies do. And I would like to compare this to the old situation of putting gas laws versus quantum calculations. Right? I mean, just think about how do I describe the gas in this room? I can now be the fine quantum physicist who does it from first principles, calculating the motion of every molecule in this room, or I can just ask uh, good old Lavoisier and Boyle, etc., for some analytic laws to understand what the gas does. I think we need both, but without any analytic understanding, you haven't understood the system. Even if you were able to calculate all the molecules in the room, you have no physical understanding of what is going on. And the second, the third problem is the complexity of parameter space. We have those billions of stars. We have a completely unknown system, namely our Milky Way in front of us, and we want, want to make sense of it. There are very many different parameters that we need something that fits to those data in a straightforward way. Of course, now we can say analytical models are by definition simple, simplified. We have to fight a bit to get the nonlinear effects in, uh, but you can model structure by perturbations. But the big problem is the end-body simulations, they also do some parametrization. It's hidden from your view in the separate physics they put in. And the worst thing, they are expensive, kind of fit the data, and even if we had a perfect model of the Milky Way. Um, this is this old example of the Chinese emperor who loved maps. He let people make a map for him. For his birthday, he once got a 1 to 100 map of his empire. And he really enjoyed it, so they made a 1 to 10 model of his empire for him. And then he said, oh yeah, I see the little houses standing there, but I still don't understand it, I need a one-to-one -one model of my empire to understand what I'm governing. Now that was the day when he disappeared in his harem um, and was carried out afterwards. But you see from that, this is not the way you understand something. You need a law that binds everything. So we will use those uh, analytic models to understand things and we need the end parties urgently because we can't make an experiment. Those end parties are partly our experiment. They develop a galaxy. It doesn't need to be the Milky Way, but we can study how heating works, how spiral arms and bars form, all those nice not linear effects, and um, how flows and migrations of stars are connected to that. Just this is our analytic model, so this is a very simple thing. You put your galaxy into concentric rings, you have a big flow of gas, there's a direct onflow, gas goes out, and with all those flows of the gas, we are then forming stars, and then there are the two important processes. One is the journey of stars, which is what we call radio migration, we will discuss this in a moment. And then there is the blurring, which is just the orbital heating of stars. So the stars get heated by encounters with molecular clouds, with galactic structure, etc. And you want to describe how they distribute over that disk according to that. Now what do we want to understand once we have it? We want to understand those observations and... Oops, sorry, I was not in particular, we want to understand what radial migration is. 
So in 2002, Selwood and Binney found this process when they just let a normal disk galaxy, just pure antibody disk, no gas, nothing, run and looked at the angular momentum redistribution of stars, which is plotted here. So this is the original angular momentum in arbitrary units. And this is the change of the angular momentum through the calculation and you can see that there are huge changes experienced by the stars. And what happens there is stars encounter a rotating potential. This is, so every spiral pattern is essentially a rotating potential trough which has its own patterns. If you manage to get bound to this pattern, this is a time-dependent potential and it's not rotationally symmetric. So angular momentum isn't conserved, energy isn't conserved, but you can transform yourself into the rotating frame of this pattern around the co-rotation resonance and you see that something which I wrongly call Jacobian all the time but it's Jacobi's integral or Jacobi's energy is conserved, which is simply energy minus pattern speed times angular momentum. And when you look at what this conservation quantity is like, it goes along here, along the direction of the circular orbits near the co-rotation resonance where it happens. So that means you can experience large changes in angular momentum while you don't get random energy. Your stars just come in calmly, they switch their positions and they go out like that. And we needed to understand this, so this is just showing you the process for one single spiral arm developing. This was just a simple I think, two arm spiral pattern that developed. This is just thin disk stars, this is hot stars, very kinematically hot stars, even far hotter than our disk. <clears throat> what the lines here show, this is the co-rotation resonance of the blue line, and you see the intense change of angular momentum around the co-rotation, which is clear, it's like surfers on a wave, when the star comes in with a speed of the wave, it can get picked up. The two news there was, um, or important news was, the thick disk stars participate quite as well, almost as strongly as the thin disk stars for this pattern, <clears throat> and very important, we thought before only that energy was conserved, in truth vertical action is conserved. It does have an imprint of data in the Milky Way that you can see when you look at the metallicity distribution. This is an old plot, um, our 2009 paper. And what happens there, you have the metallicity distribution, here metal poor stars on the left, metal rich stars on the right hand side, the number of stars here green, Error bars are the counts of the stars, and the red line is the model chest in addition to doing the normal galactic physics, imp implementing a variable churning coefficient, this radial migration, and you suddenly fit the Milky Way perfectly, uh, or the metallicity distribution perfectly. And you can see this was the best we could do without churning and without blur, uh, without churning and without also without the random motions of the star. But essentially, you might have a chance of the left side to streak your galaxy, but on the right hand side, you can't explain the little rich stars in the solar neighborhood. But you can use them now to constrain how strong the churning is, and so compared to the blurry stars are mixed throughout the entire galaxy. So this is where stars end up that were born at 5, uh, 7.5 and 50 kiloparsecs per eccentric <coughs> radius. Okay, the other thing why we, now you could argue that something special might have, have happened to the galactic disk and the word comes to do so, but there is one thing that really tells you that you have very few other ways to explain this data, which is the H metallicity relation. So to the right hand side you have the H, to the left hand side, uh, to the upside you have the metallicity. And this is the Geneva Copenhagen survey data, just uh, resolved as a probability distribution function. And this is the model for comparison. And here I've got the metallicity distribution functions at blueberry down H's 
green uh, intermediate ages and very old ages. So you see how the distribution widens, why the mean metallicity of your distribution just stays the same. And this increased scattering, constant metallicity, can only be explained by migration. If you now wanted to assume pockets of different metallicity gas, uh, gas muddling around in your Milky Way, you would have a serious problem to do to exactly get this distribution function right. Um, plus, Occam's razor tells you not to do so because we can't see them currently. We see a perfectly smooth metallicity gradient in the current disk. And it's questionable how that should have risen just exactly like the scattering coefficients tell you. Okay. A widespread phenomenon of the thick disk. Migration can explain that. And so this is just a different galaxy. You see how this profile is there with two exponential profile vertically. For the Milky Way, this was the old SDSS data from Urich et al. 2007. And what do people typically consider the thick disk? And there we have to be very careful because they are assuming or combining different qualities. One is the vertical profile, so the thick disk is naturally thicker, has a larger scale height, but they also claim this bimodal behavior, so this is the over 20 years developed paper 2007, so the bimodal behavior in the alpha elements like magnesium, silicon, oxygen versus iron. Um, when you go up in iron, so just look at the upside, this is just the neuron on the other side. Um, so you see there a high alpha abundance rich line and a low alpha abundance rich line. And the same when one did the uh, kinematic selection of Bansky et al., the high alpha rich line versus the low alpha rich line. And so people said, well, this is two different things, they are two different disks combined into our big disk. Until we looked that up in our model, and this is also an old plot which shows you um, this is our fully smooth chemical evolution model. Nothing bad happened. No merger, no catastrophe, just pure chemical evolution. And when you look at it, the density show a thick disk rich line and a thin disk rich line on the bottom. The thin disk just being created and broadened by this migration. So when you look at how the single radii in your galaxy develop, those follow the black lines. And then just by migration of stars combining into this rich line down here, whereas you have the rich line of the thick disk. And naturally, the stars from the inner disk are also hotter. So those alpha enhanced stars here will all have very high scale heights and very hot kinematics. Well, can you model what sets the speed at which you move down your black lines? This is the supernova 1A rate. Uh, which is one big unknown. I did do a study um, for some colleagues because they wanted to assess the gap. And that was pretty sobering because the result is mainly negative. I had a depopulation of this gap between factors of two or so and factors of a thousand. Not changing anything. The only thing we know is that chemical uh, chemical evolution models need to produce that. We don't know how strong the gap is. We would need to do a lot of weird things to get rid of the gap. What we could learn, however, and this is again why I'm so much about uh, getting those abundances fully correctly. When you have an exact estimate of the densities in those gaps, you can constrain the supernova on a rates and you can constrain the specific history of the galaxy down there. But for that we need to know the errors very well because all this stuff here just sheds over into this space and we can't really disentangle it so far. Um, just, this is just an analytical equation. The only thing that you have to take from this when you blame the disk stars out to the outer disk, you have something that is called adiabatic expansion when the action is conserved. And you see that the scale height of the, uh, of the populations here increases.
according to the surface density times the shape factor for the potential. And this then gives you an exponential increase below the disk. And a typical parameter that one can assume this is factors of 2 to 3 or 7 kiloparsec distance to our Milky Way disk when we bring stars up. So this is typically um, enough. And also, I don't want to go into details. There was now a long-term argument in, um, among n-body physicists. If it takes place in the n-bodies or if not, there was mostly an argument between uh, Lubman and Minchev. Um, but most recently, I think, Ivan wrote a paper um, that says that he finds this effect now too. And so he's very happy to have found this first. Um, good. Let's go back. The chemically short thick disk of Bensky et al. So they looked at the bottom of the disk, and when you go to the inner disk, you see a lot of those high alpha enhanced stars. When you go to the outer disk, at very large radii, they go less and less. What is happening here? So, I would call this the edge of radio migration. Just to show you, there have now been three papers of apogee on the same topic, always those abundance planes versus uh, position in the galaxy. And to look at one thing, one thing that we can very easily understand is this block down here. This is the thin disk block. And the further you go out in the galaxy, the lower your mean metallicity becomes, which the most simple of all possible simplistic naive models has already predicted. That's the next apogee paper showing exactly the same again the abundance plane when you go outwards in radius and when you go up in the plane. So from near the plane to about two kiloparsecs above the plane. Now why are we seeing this, especially this fading out here that we see on the right hand side? Very few high offer stars in the outermost bits of that. And to get a bit of an understanding, I would like to look at how radio migration really looks like. So to estimate how strong radio migration is in the disk, you need to know how much spiral pattern you have and how often you encounter spiral pattern that develops in the case. Now when you do this, you can link it to the tumor Q and ultimately link it to just the mass in which ring in your galaxy, which is very simplistic, but seems to have worked out for n-body models who did three um, disk calculations to get very similar results. And this is the development of the migration coefficients, so strong migration in the inner disk, and then dropping off quite rapidly towards the outer disk. Now when you just do a pocket numerical experiment of where stars end up when you start them at a certain point, so these are stars that start very much here in here, so uh, color by color the time after I start this, and then look how the population migrates outwards or inwards. <clears throat> you can see, I mean the guys that are here don't do a lot, but every day that I start in the inner disk regions, runs into a wall at around 12 kiloparsec on galactic times. No migration beyond that. So it's very natural that if, as we suspected already in 2009, those high offer stars form in the inner disk, they will not migrate to a point beyond that. So I would like to phrase it differently in those models, and here you see the same in the um, Hayden et al. paper, same approach here again, is fading out. Um, I would phrase that rather as we are not seeing a scale length for the thick disk. This has been lost ages ago by migration. But what we are seeing is the outer edge of the radial migration, which tells us also a little bit about that the outer disk history of the Milky Way was probably pretty quiet if that holds true. This is the angular momentum. 
guiding center of radius uh -huh. redistribution, which is why I call that RT. But the, but the actual uh, distribution is a bit wider. Yes. It's different. Yeah, it's different because the stars are longer at, at high uh, radius. Yes. So the, the, the actual, what, what you see in the Milky Way should be, should, should be steeper. It will a bit less steep than this. But in the inner, it would be inclined to the Earth. And uh, yeah, it will, so they will leak a bit further than this, on average, in kiloparsec or so, which is also quite consistent. I mean, even at the large radii, they still see their stars. Some of them, here you see them. So even at 14 kiloparsec. So I, I would actually have, a, I would suspect that quiet migration would have a problem if there wasn't this leaking. In addition, but it, by tendency, this is the region where you expect the edge. I mean, you can't nail it down without any further tests to, to kiloparsec or so. That's why I just stayed with the guiding center radius because it's anyway a little bit uncertain where it is. But um, yeah, <clears throat> it, it, it is approximately at the position where you would expect it, given those factors. The, the other thing is, I mean, I just plug that into the models and just look at the main features. You have this inner uh, down disk block migrating to the left, and when you go further up, you see more of the alpha rich stars, and uh, this is approximately as much structure as you see here, apart from an interesting lack of stars here. I would like to know about that. Just this is the old SMB models, I'm currently cooking new models, but this is the same plot again. We see the thin disk plot migrating to the left. At the higher disk, this is just at 4 kiloparsec altitude, so not relevant for apogee. But you see an increase in the importance of the metal rich stars and uh, alpha enhanced stars up here when we go up. So essentially the same structures. And with that, I would like to conclude. Um, there are three types of conclusions here. One is a little bit sad statement that I don't think we are yet ready because of all the big surveys because we haven't handled all those um, uncertainties in our data and we are in high danger and we need to get this settled before Gaia comes out so that we have some reasonable science and some reasonable scientific use made up of that. I offer a couple of things that need to be done to address this, including control and body calculations to get down to the laws on what happens if, which the n bodies are really good in answering. And these are some scientific conclusions I would have on that stage. Questions? So you mean the effect on chemical evolution of the stars or the effect on the kinematics? Thank you. 
frameworks in between the Halo, a couple of hot stars, that is most of the evil FX layer doing and the impact of the chemical evolution itself is probably small. Um, apart from a couple of no brain uh, enriched elements. Hydrogen 15 for example. Other questions?
this thing as a void. Um, what this tells me is that there must have been significant inside out formation, and in particular inside out formation at very early times in the Milky Way. Um, probably time scale comparable to the supernova rays. So about two years, three years. Um, quantification to time, I know. But these are, this is the first plot that we need to demonstrate inside our formation for the world to wait. Okay, is there a final question? What is the time scale of migration? How long does it take to go out to 12 kilopas? Or can you say that everything that is now beyond 12 kilopas is born in secret? Okay, number one, um, time scale of migration. There is one thing where you don't have to believe my models actually, which is when you look at the dispersion um, of the metallicity distribution versus time. If you just simple the, the line exercise on your sheet of paper, we have a minus 0.06 metallicity gradient until 6 billion years this goes to uh, this, the dispersion grows to 0.24 dex in abundance. So you can estimate that within 5 billion years you have in the solar neighborhood a sizable range of about 5 ish kiloparsecs for the stars. Very rough, you can multiply with this by number. So it goes very quickly. You can also see it on this plot. I mean, already after 2 giga years and 4 giga years, you have a sizable spread in your populations here. Concerning the second question about if those guys that have been born out. Say, I would like to go a bit further on at 16 kiloparts of them. So, our reclaimed population, <clears throat> um, if you believe the naive expectation, yes. If you find stars that are different, this would point to some serious thing happening to the Milky Way. So, those migration coefficients are built on the assumption of the quiet disk. If you manage to throw in a merger that stirs up the outer disk and leads to significant migration there, and actually, Colleague Bird, I think, did quite some nice work on that, then you would expect more migration at the outer disk, and you could essentially detect it by star city.